We're going to, so this week we are in John chapter 12. <clears throat> we finished up John 11 last week talking about the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And so this week will be our last week in John for a couple weeks because we're going in next week we're starting our sermon, our Advent sermon, sermon series, and it's called Let Earth Receive Her King. We don't need a president. We have a king. And so that's what matters. Amen? Right? And so that's what our, 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 our focus is going to be on. Let earth receive her king. So today, we're going we're gonna to start in chapter 12 because this story is very important to where we've been coming out of Lazarus' story and following into the last days of Jesus. And so we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11 of John chapter 12. The story at the beginning of John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner party, a dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him, and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. This is verse, verse 10 and 11 I find very interesting. Then the leading priests decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Father, we ask that you would bless this word this morning, that you would <clears throat> take our, our time together this morning. For those that are watching online, that you would just be with them right in the midst where they are so that they would feel a connection to your spirit this morning, Jesus. And for whatever it is that you have to say to us, we want to solidify in our hearts that you are the only thing that matters to us. You are the only thing that matters. Everything else falls behind. Help us this morning to soak in your word, to marinate in it, so that our hearts are touched and our, we are changed by the message of this word. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. So this story was actually told in Matthew, Mark, and John. A lot of you would say, well, isn't there a woman in Luke that does the same thing? There is, this has happened to Jesus multiple times, okay? I don't know what it is about Jesus that women love to come and wipe their hair on his feet. I don't know what it is about Jesus. Maybe he had beautiful feet. I, I don't know. I find it interesting that John spends about 50% of his gospel on the final week of Jesus' life. I mean, we are in chapter 12 of 21 chapters in John, and we are, we are going this last, the whole last half of John covers the last seven days of Jesus' life, the burial, resurrection, and all of that. Uh, Mark only spends about 40% of his book on the last week of Jesus' life. Matthew spends about 33%. Luke spends about 25%, even though Luke is a larger, much larger gospel. So, it's no doubt that those last seven days are the most important thing since the beginning of the universe, the first seven days. But John takes his time as he meticulously records the most important things that ever happened that he experienced, and he wants us to have a front row seat to what happens. And in our scripture today that we just read about, it's covered in three of the four Gospels. John doesn't give us all the details that some of the other writers have given us, 
But some of the other writers give us information that John doesn't give us. So we're going to kind of, um, as we go along this morning, I'm going to kind of try to piece it together so that we know I'm a story person. Like I, I, see, I see the Bible stories as stories, so I want to be like a fly on the wall, you know, or a mouse in the corner to see what's happening, you know, or maybe a rat in the corner to see what's happening, you know, as, as Jesus is doing all that he's doing and everything that's happening. I want to see what's going on and I want to experience it right firsthand. So as we go along today, we're going to kind of piece it together as we go. But first, let me ask a rhetorical question. Everybody know what a rhetorical question means, right? You don't answer. This is something for you to think about. This question is this. What is the only thing that matters to you? What is the only thing that matters to you? Now, we have been in... John for, for about 30, this is our 31st week in the Gospel of John. Last week, last week we finished up seeing Jesus raise Lazarus, a man that had been dead for four days. We see Mary and Martha's heartbreak, ask them asking Jesus to do something for their brother that, that Jesus even cared about and loved. But Jesus lets him die. I read something from Charles Spurgeon this week that he wrote. He said, If God doesn't give you silver, it's because He intends to answer you with gold. If God doesn't answer you with gold, He intends to answer you with diamonds. If God doesn't answer how you expect, maybe it's because He's going to answer with what you couldn't even begin to believe or ask for or expect. That's just how good God is. So between chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and chapter 12, about a two-month gap has happened. Jesus kind of goes off. He, he stops doing his, his public ministry. He goes to more of a private ministry. I think a lot of this is where you see the individuals that would come to Jesus to get healing, the individual messages that Jesus would give to his disciples. He did a lot of teaching to his disciples in that two-month gap, in that two-month period. But Jesus knew this. He stayed away from Jerusalem because he knew that the leading priests and, and the, 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 the leaders of Jerusalem wanted to murder him. And not only murder him, we find out they want to murder Lazarus too, the guy that Jesus just raised from the dead. I think that's hilarious. that they, They're going to kill the man Jesus has brought back from the dead and Jesus could just be like, boom, back from the dead again. Kill him again, boom, back from the dead again. I mean, that, I find so funny that they would think that they could do that. Jesus stayed away from Jerusalem because he knew that God had a specific timeline of how he wanted things to happen. And I don't want to spoil it for you, but Jesus dies on the cross right at the exact moment when the priest, the high priest, is going in to sacrifice the lamb that will be the atoning sacrifice for the entire sins of all the people. And at the exact moment... That that lamb is sacrificed is the last moment that Jesus takes his last breath as he dies on the cross for the atonement of our sins and the sins of the entire world. So Jesus knows God's timeline. He knows it has to happen at Passover. He knows that there's the exact moment and everything has to line up exactly the way God wants it to line up. And so Jesus is patient. And he stays back until the time of Passover. And that's where we come to today in chapter 12. Our scripture today tells us that it was six days before the Passover celebration began. Jesus comes to the home, to Bethany, the home of Lazarus. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that he literally comes to, to Lazarus' home, even though he does stay a lot at Lazarus' home. He comes to the town of Bethany. Now, if you go over to Israel right now, and I would love it if we could all go together, like all of us go collectively together and visit Israel and go to the different places and maybe go through the stories that Jesus went through. If you go to Bethany today in Israel, it is still known as the town of Lazarus, the man that Jesus raised from the dead. It is Even today, 2020, it is known as the town of Lazarus, the man that Jesus raised from the dead. Even my father, who has gone there multiple times, has, has said that as you go into Bethany, they have all these shops that have these little trinkets of stuff of Jesus, the pictures of Jesus and Lazarus, the little figures and all this stuff that you can collect. We find out verse 2 tells us that, that Jesus was there. There was a dinner prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with 
Jesus. Matthew and Mark tell us the, the dinner was actually given in the home of a man by the name of Simon the leper. Uh, wouldn't you love to have uh, that name? <clears throat> Simon the leper. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, this would not happen unless he did not have leprosy. And how is the only way that you don't have leprosy? Jesus heals the man that once had leprosy. So, in, in fact, his name should have been called Simon, the man who used to have leprosy. Or that's, that's how they should have referred to him. But he was known as Simon the leper because all of his life he had had leprosy. And we all know if you have a leprosy, you don't get to hang around other people. You don't have relationships with other people. Even your family members, you don't have relationships with them. So Jesus heals this man, Simon the leper. And obviously he was a very wealthy man. His family was very wealthy. So they decide in the town of Bethany, hey, we're going to throw a party for Jesus because not only has he healed a man that has leprosy, our buddy Simon, the leper, that would have aggravated me to keep calling me Simon the leper. That, that would have just gotten my nerves. And not just did he heal Simon the leper, but he also raises Lazarus from the dead and everybody saw it happen. And so they throw a party for Jesus at the home of Simon the leper. Now this dinner party was thrown. Now even though Jesus is staying at the home he stays the night at the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. He's having this dinner party at Simon the leper's house. Matthew and Mark don't tell us whose house it was, but, and it does, they don't even tell us that Mary it was the one that anointed Jesus. They simply say a woman came in and interrupted the dinner. And I think the reason that Matthew and Mark do that is because Matthew and Mark wrote their Gospels pretty soon after Jesus' death and resurrection. And I think it was because Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Simon the leper were all still alive, and they didn't want to put a target on them any more than there already was a target, so they kind of kept them out of it. But by this time, John writes his gospel back long after Jesus has already risen from the dead, ascended into heaven. And so John writes this, I think, because Lazarus is already dead. Again, pretty pitiful that he had to die twice. And I think that Simon's dead. Mary and Martha probably are, are dead or even out of the picture or out of threat. And I think that's why John writes the way he does and doesn't give as many. He gives names that Matthew and Mark do not. John tells us that this meal was held in honor of Jesus, to honor him. So imagine this picture of, of a table. It would be low to the ground. Uh, it would be, it was, these people knew how to eat, man. Like reclining, laying back. Chewing on a hamburger or sandwich or something. Uh, just kind of re relaxing. Your feet would not be under the table like it is for us today. They were laid out behind you. So your face would be towards everybody else. You would have conversation. And you see that this is how G this woman could come. This woman doesn't come up under the table and wash Jesus' feet. Jesus' feet are out from under the table. They're all reclining. And so we see that at this table... You have pretty popular people. You have Jesus, which is the biggest name in town. You have Lazarus, the second biggest name in town. And you have Simon, who was a former leper. That's a very big thing. How do you go from having leprosy to being... It is because of Jesus only. Verse 2 tells us that Martha is serving. And that's where we find Martha almost all the time. Martha's heart, Martha's, the thing she loved to do the most was to serve. That's what Martha did. I mean, we see her in the story before we've talked about it, how that when Jesus comes to their home and Martha is cooking dinner and Mary's not in the kitchen, Mary is at the feet of Jesus, listening, just absorbing every single word Jesus says. And Martha's like, well, Jesus, you need to get her, tell her to get up in here, into the kitchen to help me do what I need to do. That's just, Martha was a server. That's how she did. She knew how to plan and prepare meals. She would be the one like, oh, if you didn't have enough to eat, let's put another scoop on your... It's, it's, that's how she was. That's how Martha was. Martha's idea of worshiping Jesus became... Was she saw it as a serving. She provided. her worship, That was her worship. Her love for Christ was demonstrated in the ability to serve. And there's a lot of people that have that same ability, and that's how they worship. That's how they, they serve Jesus, is by they serve other people. But I want you to see verse 3. Verse 3 says that then Mary 
took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance. Now this had happened before. Mary Magdalene, we know, the woman who had had seven demons, that Jesus cast these seven demons out of her. She was a prostitute. She was a living and immoral life. Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee. Simon, his name was Simon as well. Simon the Pharisee. Luke tells us a lot about this story. Jesus has healed this woman, has cast the demons out of this woman. She comes to dinner. Jesus walks in where you normally would have somebody wash your feet because that's how you, you showed that you cared about the people that were in your house. You would wash their feet and then you would put some anointing oil on them so that they would smell good because they didn't have showers and baths like we do today. They would all stink. So everybody wanted to smell good in the house. So they'd, they would dab a little bit of oil on you as you walk in. And they'd, wash your, they'd have a servant there to wash your feet or you would wash the feet of the person that was behind you coming in. But nobody did that to Jesus. Simon the Pharisee was, he was showing what he thought about Jesus, how he felt about Jesus by not washing his feet or even having his servants wash his feet. And this woman, Mary Magdalene, who was a prostitute, she bursts in the door. She comes in with a jar of perfume, weeping. And she comes and anoints Jesus' feet and it's almost the same exact scenario that happens, but this is just a different woman because this woman had been saved out of the life of adultery and a life of sin, being tormented by demons. And we even sing the song about it, and then Jesus, we love you. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. That's Mary Magdalene. That's the woman that you will find that Jesus appears to the very first person he appears to after he rises from the dead was Mary because he had this relationship with her that he cared about her. But in our scripture today, Luke has given us Mary Magdalene. But this is, in our story, it tells us that Mary took a 12-ounce jar of spikenard. It was essence of nard, which is spikenard. And he used it to anoint Jesus. So uh, imagine this is a this is a 16.9 fluid ounce, and so I've drunk a little bit of water out of it this morning, and so you have about 12 ounces right now in this bottle that I have made sure that I didn't drink any more. So I will drink some in just a minute to make sure that for my object lesson we have 12 ounces in this bottle. Okay, for perfume and oil, especially spikenard. Spikenard is a very powerful, potent perfume oil that would be poured out and used. And, and this would be something that Mary, a lot of people believe that this was something that she used as a dowry for her marriage. That when she found the husband, that, that she would take this spikenard and she would, she would give it as a gift to the person and, 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 and that she would be married to, that would be the gift she gives her husband. It was very valuable to her. It was the most important thing that Mary had. Now, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were very wealthy. We know that. Spikenard was a rare, I mean an incredibly rare thing that anybody would have, especially that amount of spikenard in your house. It would show how wealthy you really were. It was the best of the best. It would have to come from uh, northern India, China, the Himalayan mountains. That's where this, this oil would come from. And it would be something that would go through a meticulous process to even get it. And it would be an outrageous price that you would pay for it. In fact, it would have to come by camel <laughs> all the way from China to Bethany, close to Israel. This jar of oil would probably be the most wealthy thing for, for Mary to have in her possession. The thing that ma mattered to her the most. And I think a lot of times we compare ourselves to each other in our worship. And I want you to see two things here. You see Mary and Martha. Martha is this servant. That's how she shows her love. She serves. She takes care of people. She makes sure that everybody's needs are met. She's always the one running around, always the one making sure that everybody has exactly what they need. And that is the way that she goes above and beyond that is her love. That is her devotion. That is her servant heart. 
But Mary's way of worshiping and loving and expressing love for Jesus was giving the most extravagant gift that she could possibly give to Jesus. Now this is, this is what I want to point out. One was not better than the other. Both were an expression of love for Jesus. But who's the one that got hounded the most? It was Mary. Verse 4 tells us, it says that Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray Jesus, he tells us, that perfume was worth a year's wage. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. But John tells us that he didn't care about the poor. In fact, he was stealing out of the, out of the offering that the disciples would carry around. Mary's perspective was this, that love always gives an, an extravagant, irrational, from a, an, an irrational heart. I found this to be true, that true generosity looks crazy to the greedy heart. True gen generosity looks insane to the, to the greedy person. 1 Peter 5.5 5 tells us, it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Mary's, Mary's posture was that of humility, of low, lowliness. The lowest servant was the one that would wash someone's feet. That was the job that you gave to the servant that was the lowest class servant. She is not low class at all. In fact, she is very wealthy. She is very high up on the list. If you were looking for the, the ones that would get into the best restaurants, that's Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But Mary doesn't allow that to become the posture of her heart. She does not allow her wealth to say, well, I'm going to get a servant to do this. What does Mary do? Mary breaks, the, breaks into the middle of this party that they're throwing for Jesus. And I'm telling you, this would be a joyous celebration party. you got Lazarus, Simon, who had leprosy, Lazarus that died, all there together. They're talking about, Lazarus, tell us what it was like to die and come back to life. And... Lazarus is like, it's not even fun, guys. I was just getting settled into my room in heaven, and all of a sudden I get called back to earth, and hurt knees, and arthritis, and having a hard time. My back's hurting, and I wish I was back in heaven. Probably something like that. That's how I imagine it. And then Mary breaks into the room, cuts into the laughter and the stories and everything, and the silence just kind of falls over the crowd. As Mary not only breaks the jar, she breaks the neck of the jar. She pours it on the feet of Jesus, and not just his feet, but his head anointing him as well. And she lets her hair down. That would be something that would not... We don't think of that much about that today. But that was a, a sign of intimacy. Something that you would only do around your husband or around your family. And it was a, seen as a disgrace. Can you imagine people like, oh, can you believe Mary did that? Can you believe Mary let her hair down in front of all these people? Mary didn't care. Mary's love was extravagant. I want you to notice that every time we see Mary in Scripture, Mary is always at the lowest point. She is always at the place where? At Jesus' feet. First time we see Mary, we see her at the feet of Jesus when she's t learning from his teachings. The second time we see Mary, she comes and she falls at the feet of Jesus in the very worst time possible. When she is grieving over her brother's death, she comes and she falls at the feet of Jesus. And then now we see her in a thankful posture at Jesus' feet once again. You know the expression, love is blind. William Shakespeare uses it in about three plays. I wonder how many times he got his heart broken. A lot of people say, well, love makes you do stupid things. I'm not going to say anything. But for Mary, pride went out the window when it came to Jesus. Judas shows his heart. But check this out. Matthew and Mark tell us that when Judas said what he said, that all the other disciples were like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 bottle, yeah, that bottle of oil could have be, been sold and the poor could have been helped. I've always found, you know, when, when you try to do something for Jesus and people complain about it, and you do it from the heart, like a gratitude heart, a, a loving heart, 
you will always get people that complain about how you did what you did. But I have always found that those that complain the most do the least. And the loudest boos come from the cheapest seats. Those that want to complain the most are the ones that usually don't do a thing. You see that in, Lazar- in, 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 in Judas. Oh, he's real quick. You know why? Because when Lazarus, when, when Judas saw what Mary had done, what was Judas thinking about? Oh man, I got my hands on that bottle. I could have sold that thing. So I was, I was looking it up. What would it be for, for, for the cost of something like that in their day and time? Imagine a minimum wage job making what you would make in Ohio. And I think I figured it around about $15,000. That's a huge gift. That's a huge chunk of change just to pour out on, on, on a guy. But it wasn't just any guy. I love how Mark writes this. Jesus' response. Jesus says in, in Mark about the same story, the same exact thing that happens. He says, leave her alone. Why do you criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? Judas, you will always have the poor with you. And Judas, you can help them whenever you want to. But you're not going to always have me. Look what he says in verse 8. He says, She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, whenever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. 2020, where are we right now? What are we talking about? What are we talking about? We're talking about the the thing that Mary did, the extravagant gift that Mary gave to Jesus. I love this. Jesus said it best. Mary did what she could. We know that this oil that Mary used to pour over Jesus' feet, according to Judas, was worth a year's salary, worth a year's wage. You're looking at about fifteen dollars to $18,000. And this was on top of what Mary, Martha, and Lazarus already did to support Jesus' ministry. They were big time in supporting His ministry, but this gift was on top of that. So the things that I find the most interesting, and if you're taking notes, this is the first one, is that Mary gave what she could. I always think about the sacrifices that have been made for us here right now. What we have. I mean, you realize that what you're sitting in right now, what you are enjoying, you're watching online, or, or, or the music that you enjoy, the seats, the cushioned seats that you're sitting in, the heated room that you're sitting, sitting in, all the lights and everything, all of those things were, were, are because of the sacrifice that was given by somebody who said, I'm looking at something bigger than myself. And we all enjoy that here today. Because of the sacrifices that were those. I read Marilyn's book that talked about how the the guys that would work on the building, the original building, would sleep out on the edge of the parking lot because they were exhausted from working all day, working into the night, and sleep there, wake up the next morning, and start all over again when the sun would come up to build the building that we sit in today. You realize that what we're sitting in now, the building, the chairs, the music, the television, the lights, those watching online, all those things we enjoy is because of the sacrifice that people made possible. Now, I'm not trying to, to make anyone feel guilty, and I'm not even t- preaching about giving or tithing at all. I'm, I'm just thankful, because we're going into Thanksgiving, I'm thankful for the sacrifices that so many people made And it encourages me to continue that for my kids and even my grandkids down the road. And it's not about money at all. I'm talking about the heart of a follower of Jesus isn't about getting. It is a follower of Jesus. We live as givers. We live open-handed. And this is why I bring this up, is because God never looks at the portion that you give. He looks at the proportion. It's not, it it, it isn't about equal giving, it's about equal sacrifice. 
We, we tell the story of the widow that gave her last two coins, the widow's mites that she gave, the two widow's mites would have been a half of a, it would have been a penny total that she would have given to the offering. And Jesus says she gave more than all of the rest of the people combined because it came from her heart. This, number two, if you're taking notes, number two is Mary did not wait to give. Now, now you think about the timeline. What if Mary would have said, you know, maybe I should wait until next year when Jesus comes around again for the Passover celebration. Maybe I should wait till next year. Maybe I should wait. What would have happened if Mary would have waited? This was Jesus' last Passover. This was the last time that she would have an opportunity to do this. There wasn't going to be a next year. Mary gave what she could, and she didn't wait to give. And number three is that Mary received more than she gave. I think about it in these terms. You think of a farmer that plants seeds. He always produces more than he plants. He does not know at the time if he's going to get a harvest or not. But he still plants in spite of knowing the return that he's going to get. That's, that's what a farmer does. Mary had no clue the return on the investment that she was going to be giving, and she didn't even care. She just did it out of a heart that gives. We know that, that our treasure isn't in our possessions. We don't give to get. Matthew, Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I can look at your bank account and see what holds your heart. I can look at your bank account right now and tell you where your heart lies. What happens so often is that, that people do a conditional giving is what they do. They set the terms of their giving with God. God, if you will just leave me where I'm comfortable... I will give when, when I will give when, it, when it's convenient for me to give. Mary gave even though she had no guarantee of a blessing or a return. Her gift of love to Jesus was seen as foolishness to those that were around her. Mocked by all of the disciples. Not just Judas. I pick on Judas, but it wasn't just Judas. All of the disciples said, yeah, that could have been sold and given money to, given to the poor. There's a difference between not caring what people think around you and actually living it. And Mary lived it out. One of the things that I know people will say was, you know, well, well I don't really have anything. Well, if I won the lottery, I would help so many people. I mean, how many, how many times have you heard that or thought that? No, you won't. If you won't give when you don't have, you won't give when you do have. That's just the heart of a person. I want to give you an example. There's a young man by the name of Derek Carr. Uh, he's a quarterback for, uh, now it's the Los, Los it's Nevada? Yeah. He used to be the, the, the Raiders, Los Angeles Raiders. And in 2017, he was given the highest amount of money that, at that time that an NFL quarterback could possibly have. A $125 million contract. $125 million contract to throw a ball and to let people hit you. $125 million. He was interviewed right after the, the, the press came out with all the information about how much he was going to get. And you want to know, they asked him, they said, you know, what are you going to do with all of this money? You have plans? You're going to go to Disney World? You're gonna, what are you going to do? You're going to buy you know, cars and houses and boats and tigers and whatever and live, you know. You know what he says? The first thing I will do is I will pay my tithe like I have since I was in college. When I was getting $700 a month on a scholarship check, I would tithe on that $700. That won't change. That's what I'll do. He said, I'll probably get my wife something nice, even though she begs me not to. She still cuts coupons. Even since I've, ever, ever since I've known her, she finds coupons. She gets online deals and tries to find discounts on everything. None of this is going to change for us. And this is, I love what he says right here. The exciting thing for me, money-wise, 
honestly, is that this money is going to help a lot of people. I'm very thankful to have it in our hands because it's going to help people not only in this country, but in all the countries around the world. That is what is exciting to me. Derek Carr grew up Christian, gave his life to Christ when he was in college, and he started helping missionaries. Even on the $700 check that he would get from his scholarship money, he would give over and above tithing to missions all across the world. And when he got this $125 million contract, that's exactly what he did. He said that it was the first thing he did was write checks out to all these different missionaries all around the world. There's one thing I do know. You cannot be a true follower of Christ if there are other things that compete for the number one place in your heart. For people like Mary and people like Derek Carr, people who would say, they would, they would tell them, you can't be rich and be a Christian. I would say, I'd say it like this. Let money be in your hands and not be in your heart. You can be dirt poor and be ruled by money. You can be the most poor person in the world and be ruled and controlled by money. You can be an extravagantly wealthy person and use what God has blessed you with to help and bless other people. So what is our response today? The big question that I asked you, the rhetorical question was, what is the most important thing in your life? Does your love for Jesus express itself in an outward way? And my challenge to us this morning is, is, is from our scripture is this, do what you can like Mary did. Do what you can. Mary did what she could. Don't wait to be a giver because Mary would have missed the blessing of giving. And my promise to you is this, is you don't give to get, but in, when you do give, you will receive more than you gave. The blessing that Mary got from doing what she did, everybody thought she was crazy. Everybody thought it was the dumbest thing for her to do that. Criticized her. But Mary, we're still talking about Mary in 2020. The gift that she gave from, from her heart. The worship that she gave. Do you know what Jesus said about Mary in, 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 uh, in, Matthew, or in Mark? In verse 9 of that story. John doesn't tell us this, but, but Mark does. He says, Jesus' Jesus' words here. He says, I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. Mary had no clue when she did what she did that people all around the world would know what she had done and would be talking about her gift to the Lord. Nor did she know that her gift would encourage others to give. So I want to ask you this. What is one thing this week that you can do to express your love for God in an extravagant way? Because we know this from, from John 3, 16, that, that, that Jesus knows that God, Jesus said that God expresses His love by giving. Guess what He gave? He gave His one and only begotten Son. How will you express your love and your worship for Christ this week in an extravagant way? Now, I know that we have about 30 or 40 kids in our Halo program that are going to need gifts this year for Christmas. And we are, I'm telling you, we are, there are people in this room that give more than they probably should. But my thing is this. God never looks at the portion you give. He, give, he looks at the proportion to what you have. My prayers for us this morning is that we would not let the money get into our hearts, but that we would use it for the, as a gift of, from God. Because some of us have been extremely blessed. Extremely blessed. I remember one Sunday I preached about um, giving, and I think it was about the widow's might, and a lady came up after church, and she had her change purse with her, and she said, Pastor, I, this is all I have left. And she dumps out uh, like 35 cents to me. And my, my, gut, my gut instinct was like, no, I don't, no, this, I'm thinking, this is what this is going to do for the kingdom, you know? That was my first knee-jerk reaction. And then I thought, no, you want, you want to know something? She's not giving this and saying, hey, guys, look what I'm giving. 
Look at all I'm giving. Guess what she did? She comes up and quietly just dumps it out. She says, will you put this in the offering when nobody's looking? I mean, to her, that was priceless. That was like all she had. That's the kind of giver I want to be. That's the kind of follower of Jesus that I want to be. Is it's not about how much I give, it's because I'm giving from a heart that wants to give because I'm not looking to get anything in return. That was Mary's heart. What's the most important thing to you? Jesus asked you that question. What would you say? Father, this morning we, we hear your message from John. We're so thankful for Mary and for her love for you and the extravagant gift that she gave. I don't want anybody to think, oh man, this is a, this is a, they're trying to guilt me into giving money. No, that's not what this is at all. This is about the heart of a true believer is that God becomes more and I become less. I use the things that God has given me, the tools that He has given me, whether that's my finances, whether that's my serving, whether that's my, my blessing of other people, whatever that is. And what, maybe that's I have a gift of serving in nurseries or I have a gift of serving with youth or whatever that is. I have a gift of doing these things and whatever that is, if it's a mu- musical instrument, whatever it is. I, maybe I'm a board member or maybe I'm a, a finance person. God, you use us all to bring glory and worship to your name. And whatever that capacity is, all you're asking for is for us to be willing to give whatever that means. So Jesus, this morning, we lay before you all that we have, all that we are, and we we ask that you would sanctify it and use it for for the purpose of your kingdom going forward so that lives would be changed, so that people would be transformed, so that people would be reached, that there would be people that would be touched by the message, by even, even the giving of other people. We're so thankful, God, as we go into Thanksgiving, we are so thankful for the sacrifices that people have made before so that we could have what we have right now. But I'm asking for more than that, Jesus, that you make us, you challenge us to be extravagant givers like Mary. So that the generations, as they pass along, our kids and our grandkids will see that there was a foundation of faith in the people of this community and this church that would give regardless of the situation and the circumstance. And that you would pour out your Spirit on us and you would teach us what it's like to be followers of Christ, to take our hands, to take that money and put it in our hands and not in our heart. Because you are the most important thing that we have. Everything else pales in comparison to you. We love you today, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.